Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Thank you all for joining us for this uh, lecture today. Uh, tonight uh, we're speaking about Islamic finance. And the, top the topic is entitled Islamic Finance 101. This is presented jointly by the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International, uh, whose facility we are in, and uh, the Islamic Finance Advisory Board, represented here by our brother uh, Rehan uh, Said Khan. Uh, so, this uh, lecture, Islamic Finance 101, encompasses uh, uh, thoughts such as uh, traditional versus conventional banks, permissible versus impermissible contracts, making contracts sh Sharia compliant, and uh, we expect that in the Q&A people may be asking about personal loans, about credit cards, about mortgages, investments, uh, and so on. Uh, so, the most capable person to present this lecture today is uh, our brother uh, Rehan Said Khan. He is a CPA, he has an MBA, MBA in Islamic Finance, he's a licensed IFQ instructor. And uh, as I mentioned in the previous announcement, uh, he was uh, educated in Islamic Finance uh, at the Islamic in, uh, International Islamic University of Malaysia. Am I right, uh, yes. Brother Rehan? So, uh, without further delay, I present to you uh, Brother Rehan I found this on the floor. This is money. <laughs> yeah, you see, that's Islam, the... Islamic finance. There you go. <laughs> All right. Let's leave it open until somebody claims it. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Can you hear me? So whatever the Sheikh told you is not true. <laughs> uh, he he over he over uh, you know sold uh, my uh, commitments and my academic requirements. I do have an MBA in Islamic finance. I'm not the expert. I'm a student. I'm your brother in Islam today, inshallah. We will talk about the principles and basics. Oh, he's gonna put me under a microphone. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. I think you could have heard me all fine without this. So inshallah, um, let me get started with the line and then what we'll do is the modus operandi will be this. We'll talk about the board a little bit. We'll talk about the industry size and comp uh, composition. What is Islamic finance? Is there such a thing as Islamic finance? Or is it all the same, right? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the principles and basics. And if we have time, uh, I know the hardest topic in Canada, you know, or at least in Toronto, is always about housing. So maybe we'll leave that uh, to a Q&A, uh, inshallah, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay? Um, so let me talk about the Islamic Finance Advisory Board. I'm going to spend very little time on this and the other thing. So this is a board. It's a not-for-profit not organization. It's engaged in the promotion of Islamic finance in Canada. This is the board. That's what it is. Okay? It's a consortium of scholars and Islamic finance professionals uh, that provide guidance, advisory, audit, education, research, and mediation services. Right? It's to facilitate the development of innovative Sharia-compliant financial services in the Canadian marketplace. Is that my microphone shape? Mm -hmm. I'm not just yeah, making sure. Yeah. You, you can still hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. So overall vision of the board is to create, uh, uh, provide guidance. And why? Because we live in a very regulated environment when it comes to banking and finance, right? All of our policies, all of our procedures are regulated. So in order for the Canadian banks and financial institutions to come to the marketplace, they like to see credibility and they like to see standardization. So they like to see unity in our community, right? So that was the purpose of the board, right? And obviously what we want to do is to contribute to the growth of Islamic finance in North America. Okay? okay. 
So the board provides three types of services. It provides advisory and consulting to different financial institutions to come into the marketplace, number one. So to provide products and services to our community. Number two, it does education and awareness. So a lot of seminars on Islamic finance. And it does also arbitration and mediation in financial disputes only, okay? So this is a group of scholars, that's all they do, okay? Uh, we can talk about that uh, later. Let's talk about the industry. How big is this industry? Um, so we have now close to, this is a little old uh, last year, but this we have close to 1,500 institutions worldwide. Looks small, but it's not that uh, small. It's over two trillion dollars. Okay, trillion has a lot of zeros, more than the billion, right? It has three more zeros than the billion, but I wanna tell you something. How many Muslims do we have in the world today? Two billion. Two billion. Close to two billion. What percentage of the total population do we represent? 25%, close to that much, a quarter of the world's population. Do you know what two trillion represents in the world today? Less than 2% of the world's assets. So we're 25% of the world's population, but we represent less than 2% of the world's total financial economy. What does that tell you? A lot of opportunities opportunity for learning and growth, okay? So just putting things in perspective. And then I won't go into the breakdown too much, but the main one is, which is the most prominent sector is the Islamic financial institutions. Unfortunately, we don't have too many in Canada or very limited. We have some in the US, but we don't have any financial institutions that are regulated by government at this time, okay? Uh, where is Islamic finance, by the way? I don't know if you can see this map, uh, but this tells you the global snapshot of Islamic banking and finance. And guess what, we're Canada. We're number one on the list, by the way. Not because we're number one in Islamic finance, just because we're number one on the leftmost side of the map. Right, so we started from here. So it tells you that Canada has a market, but it has it in finance, just in mutual funds, investments, etc. Right, but uh, the U.S. is really popular. It has three chartered banks and it has many financing companies that offer Sharia compliant financial services. Canada, we have some too, so we're not completely off, but we have some, but limited ones. And then obviously, the yellow spots that you see, this is Islamic finance, the Muslim populous nation, right? So Muslim populous means either there are countries that are Islamic, okay, under the OIC, or they have a significant minority of Muslims in Western jurisdictions that offer Islamic financial services. Let's go into the principles and basics of Islam and Islamic finance, right? What is the objective? We call, we talk, the scholars, they talk about something called the maqasid. Maqasid al sharia, right? Maqasid means the objectives of the Islamic tenets, right, of the Sharia, of Islam. So, in the maqasid, in the objectives of Islamic law, it is to promote, this by our greatest, one of the great historians, Imam al-Ghazali, he says, the objectives of the Islamic law are to promote human welfare in five things. Number one, faith, all faith, right, or iman. Number two, life. Number three, intellect. Number four, the family, society, the progeny. Number five is wealth. We have to make sure that we encompass the safeguarding of all of these, including our wealth. We all know on the Day of Judgment when we wake up, there's five types of questions. There's five questions that were asked. Two of them are regarding what? your life. How did you spend it? How did you earn it? Right? Your youth. Sorry. How did you spend your life? How did you spend your youth? Number three is, how did you earn your wealth? Number four is, how did you spend it? How did you spend it? 
And the fifth one is regarding knowledge. What did you do with the knowledge that you were given? Right? So wealth is very, very important. How do we earn it? How do we spend it? It's a tenet of our faith. Obviously our principles of the law are derived from the holy book, the Quran, the traditions of the Prophet Sallallahu the Sunnah, and the juristic interpretation of the Imams that have preceded us, right? So let's talk about the principles and basics. What is money? What is al-mal? Is money this uh, $2 coin that I found on the floor? Or is it uh, the Bitcoin that's not doing so well? Stock market? What is it? How does Islam define money? Right? So I'm going to keep it simple today and we'll go into the Q&A. So money is a measure of value. Anything that you can give value to is considered mal for us at this time. Okay? Number one, it's not a commodity, it's not to be traded. Basically, it itself should not be considered a form of trade. Hence, coming to the concept of riba. So, right? So, if I give you more money, if I give you this money and ask you back for more, it becomes a commodity. It's money on money. So, come to that. So, money is a measure of value, not a commodity. Interest or usury is prohibited. Does anybody know the difference between interest and usury? Have you heard the word usury before? Yeah? No? What is interest? Riba. What is riba? Riba means money that we put extra. I'll give you, I'll give you $100 and you ask me back to give you 150 That's interest. That's, That's riba. riba. Very good. The extra amount on top of a loan is equal to riba. Very good. Subhanallah. Allah has permitted sale, trade, and forbidden riba. We'll talk about it. What is the difference? Anyway. So interest is any amount on top of the original money that you give. Usury in the Webster dictionary means an excessive amounts of interest. So high amounts of interest. Do you know that there's a law against usury in Canada? There's a law against riba in Canada? In Islam, anything above and beyond the original amount is interest, is a riba. In Canada, anything over, you know how much? 59.9% is a riba. You can go to jail for it. Okay, so 60% and above is riba in Canada, by the way. And then capital should be gainfully deployed and not left idle. So we believe in the concept of investing, not leaving the money in the bank and letting it grow. Okay? We rather invest in the businesses, invest in people, allowing people to invest. For example, the Prophet ﷺ, he had no money. Right? But he was paired up with Sayyidina Khadija, his wife. Right? Even before they got married, she had money. He didn't. She gave him the money and they used to buy goods together. Right? He, he would buy goods with that money, go to Syria, do some business, come back, do more business and profit share on an agreed upon ratio. Didn't just leave money in the bank or gave money as a loan and say pay me back whether you make it or not. Right? So. That's the concept of capital should be gainfully deployed and not left idle. No speculative transaction in the Islamic law. So anybody who deals with the stock market, no short selling, no undue uncertainty. Okay? <clears throat> Risk and reward sharing. We've all heard the saying, no pain, no gain. Very good. Thank you, sister. Right? So if you don't take a risk in business, you're not entitled to a return. Right? We promote 
the creation of real goods and services in the economy. That's the main purpose of Islamic finance, right? To take risks together. And then, of course, social and ethical investments. Our beautiful religion today, <coughs> right, uh, it automatically excludes incomes or investments into things that are impure or haram, right? For example, in gambling, tobacco companies, alcohol, pork, financial institutions that give you riba, we're not allowed to be part of this. Today, if you look at the ESG index, or it's called the Environmental, Social, and Government Governance Index, it has most of these stocks out of it anyway. And they happen to be Sharia compliant, and they're doing really, really well. Okay, so this model is proven over and over again, alhamdulillah, over time, by the grace of Allah. Uh, debt in Islam is a responsibility. We believe in the concept of saving now and buying later. Not buy now and pay later. You get all these ads. No payment six months, no payment twelve months. We like it, don't we? You get a new sofa, you get a new car. It happens, right? You buy a car, you buy a sofa, you buy furniture, you buy a house. So in Islamic law, we believe in the concept of saving now. And paying later. Not the opposite. You know what the longest verse in the Quran is? What do you say? Sorry, the question? Longest, verse. longest verse. Longest verse in the Quran. Is Forget that, what it is. Tell me what you think it talks about. Is that the Bible? Is that the Bible in the day? Oh, he knows. He's, he's an expert, <laughs> mashallah. Surah Al Baqarah is the longest chapter in the Quran and Ayat al Din. So when they asked me this in Malaysia, I'm not a scholar, I'm your brother, I said maybe it talks about. Jannah, or Jahannam, <laughs> right? Maybe it talks about Tawheed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the largest verse in the Qur'an to speak about what? No. A dain, debts, financial transactions that occur in future. So is this important to us? Absolutely. Sheikh, whenever you do janazas here? No. No? But close by? You're participating in a funeral, you have, right? Do you know what they ask the family? If there is any debt outstanding, come forward to meet the family members or forgive. Why? It's a good question. We'll answer it later, <laughs> inshallah. But think about it. Why? It's a big question. The Prophet ﷺ did not pray the janazah for those who died in debt and didn't leave anything behind unless someone guaranteed to pay their debt. It's a big thing. So we take all these loans and we never pay back. We pay the minimum payments and we're good, right? Talk about riba a little bit. What is the prohibition? What does Islamic finance stem from? So number one, this is the only sin in the Quran where the term harb is used. Harb means war against Allah and His Messenger. To the closest meaning, Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse 278 and 279 to the closest meaning. Give up whatever remains of riba if you are believers. Okay? Interest or usury. And if you do not, then be prepared to declare war against Allah and His Messenger. We go into the tafsir of these ayat. My shaykh is here. It says on the day of judgment, if you wake up, the angels will come to you. 
and they'll bring you weapons just to be fair with you. And they'll ask you to start a war against the creator of the heavens and the earth. Allah protect us from riba. And then any involvement in riba is cursed. So people, you know, come to us and they say, hey, listen, I'm not taking interest, I'm paying it. <laughs> right? I'm not taking it, I'm paying it. Um, this is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which talks about any involvement in riba is cursed. So the one who takes it, the one who pays it, the one who writes the contract, and the one who witnesses it. They're all cursed by Allah and His Messenger, they're all equal in sin, right? They're all the same. That's what it says here. Riba is not an Islamic sin, it's prohibited in practically every other faith. Right? The non Abrahamic faiths and the Abrahamic ones, right? So, the Code of Hammurabi, the Hindu law, Plato, Canada even has laws against usury, right? And our cousins, the Jews and the Christians, they also have very strong references to riba as well. So it's not an Islamic sin, it's a universal sin. So let's define riba now for our practical purpose. Right? Because this is the sin that is so huge, we should understand how to navigate around it. So, what does it mean? You know, Arabic language, I don't, I'm not an Arabic student, very little, but it always has the technical meaning and the literal meaning. So, what does riba mean? Riba means increase, excess, addition. Right? Anything above and beyond. Riba. <coughs> The technical meaning of riba for us, and we're talking about one type of riba, which is the financial riba, or riba nasiya for us, is an excess amount received on a loan stipulated over time. So, excess amount stipulated on a loan over time. Okay? So now, brother, what is your name? Hassan. Hassan. Okay, we're going to... Have an example together. So if I give you a hundred dollars and ask you for a hundred and fifty dollars and you pay me in one week, what is this? This is a loan with? With the riba. With riba. With a qad ma riba. Right? Yes, it's a riba with qad. We all agree? We all understand? Okay. Let's say I give Brother Hassan a hundred dollars, he wants the money, and he pays me back a hundred. Is this allowed in Islam? Yes or no? Yes, of course. Okay. Ask you, I want to make sure. Is <laughs> it right? How many people think it's uh, no? I don't know. Right? I need to ask. What if I give you a hundred dollars and I say, pay me back, Brother Hassan? But after one week, he comes and gives me 150. Is this allowed? Yes. How many people think? Yeah, yes? That's how you say it. This, uh, the way I said it. Yeah, so, mean is, there is no you agreement. brought 100. There is no agreement. Is it gift? I think it's allowed. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You can give it yet. It's okay because it's not in your original class. You're giving it by yourself. Yeah, it depends how you say it. So, how many people say this is allowed? It's allowed, it's allowed, but it depends, there is a question. How many people say no? It's not allowed. Oh, you're saying no, so can I give the sisters a chance? Yes, you want to tell me why it's not allowed? So I said, I'm going to give you $100, pay me back next week. But he came and he gave me 150 Being grateful. Thank you. Very good question. But we're not taking interest. I didn't ask for it. He wants to give it to me because he loves me. And I love him too because he paid me more. <laughs> it's hadiya. Good. So is that allowed? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Because it's not stipulated. I did not ask for it in the agreement. 
Do you know this is the sunnah of the Prophet? Every time our Prophet took a loan, not just our Prophet Muhammad, even Musa and others, anytime they were indebted, they always returned more than they gave, than they took. But it cannot be stipulated. Right? Musa a.s. was married to one of the daughters of the Sheikh of Madian, right? And he made a contract. Agreement. Agreement. Work for me for eight years or ten. If you do ten, it is better for you. What do you think he did? Eight or ten? Right? The Prophet a.s. he told us, the Prophets of Allah always do more. They they reach the concept of ahsan, right? Do a little bit more excellence, inshallah. Clear? So it has to be stipulated, it has to be excess amount. But, let's say I give him a hundred dollars and he gives me fifty back. And I'm okay with it. That's fine. That's fine. Fine, you're okay with it. Let's, huh? I have to ask myself, <laughs> am I sure I'm okay with it? That's a good question. It's entirely the situation. Let's say he asked me for more time. Brother, I don't have money, can you give me another week? Can I charge him a fee of five dollars and say, okay, pay me back the hundred? No. Why not? It's not allowed. It's not allowed. Mm, I like this, okay, good. Good, you cannot charge anything above and beyond the original principle. What if I, you gave me the money in, uh, I don't know, in my uh, country, we call it rupees, and it devalues, and ten years later you pay me. Say, brother, this hundred rupees is worth one dollar now. It used to be worth a hundred sometime. Tricky question. Let's go to the next step, inshallah. Okay, so the riba I'm talking to you about is called riba al qurud or riba al Quran. This is the riba that's mentioned in the Quran. The formula is simple, and we're going to go through the same example. Riba interest is equal to dain debt minus the loan. Okay, so let's say, and this is the formula. If R is greater than zero, it is interest. If R is less than zero, it is sadaqa, charity, right? At the end, you were And if R is equal to zero, then this is the one that is the most encouraged act of worship, by the way. So, money lending in Islam is an act of worship in ibadah. You're doing business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one that will return the riba, the increase, the profit. Don't ask his creation. Okay? But there is a question. Uh, are we allowing or are we going to... Yeah, yeah. One or two I can take. <laughs> so what if you know he's going to do haram with the money? You still lend him? We'll answer that at the end. With the sheikh. That's why I have a sheikh with me. Yes. Someone you gave him money. Uh huh. And you agree with him at times. Yes. And later he said, I don't have money. Do whatever you like. And he's a Muslim and he's prayed. So, what is the situation we have to understand? Is he taking advantage of tonight, your lecture? So, if somebody give, if you give somebody money and they don't pay you back, on time. On time. So now he's coming to the verses of the Quran, Shaykh. Right? In Surah Baqarah. If somebody is in difficulty and asks you for more time, you grant it to them. And if you forgive, it is better for you only if you do. Right, Shaykh? In Surah Baqarah. Same verses. Continuation. So, you're exercising one of the ayahs of the Qur'an if you're giving your brother more time. And if you forgive, it is better for you. 
But if he has the money and doesn't want to pay you, he's going on vacation, then that's between him and Allah. Right? Simple answer. Come and look. Coming to this, so any questions here? This is simple, right? We already went through the example. So look, it brings us to the next part of our um, uh, risk, money. You know, you gave money, you thought you lost money. Actually, you didn't lose any money. Risk. We talk about sustenance. We ask for a lot of money all the time, right? We want money, we want money, we want risk. Risk is actually much bigger than that. Wealth, it's health, family, everything, right? So the only thing I'm going to tell you here is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote down a risk where? Not yesterday. Not the day we were born. Not in our mother's womb. He wrote down a risk 50,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth. You will not die till you eat your last meal. You will not die till you earn your last penny. The only thing you have in your hands is halal or haram. Even if you run away from it, it will come to you. So why choose the haram? Make sense? Purpose of a financial system. Let's go into finance now a little bit. More practicality. How does the system of finance work in economics? Uh, it's to ensure the flow of funds from SSU savings, surplus units, to SDUs to add wealth to the economy. What are these? Let me explain. Okay? Uh, you all go to the bank? Yes? Where's your money? At home or at the bank? <laughs> at home? Inside the bed? Mashallah. That's the bank too. Uh, it works. Don't tell anybody your address, okay? <laughs> we have a lot of problems in our community today. So, saving surplus unit says you go to the bank, right? You all have a bank account. You go put, deposit your money in the bank. Saving surplus units means you save more than you spend. <coughs> okay? You earn more than you spend. Sorry, that's the right word. You make $100, but you spend $80. Sorry. So you have $20 as a surplus. So you go put that in the account. Make sense? When you go put that in the bank, what happens? The banks, they take your money and they lend it out to people. Okay, am I being forced to come closer? No, no, okay. no. You're fine. Okay. You're fine. Yeah. Good. So, they lend money on interest. I'm just going to tell you how the banks work. Let's say they charge 5% interest. Haram, but I have to tell you how it works. They take 5% from X, they collect it, now they pay you because you have a savings account, even though you didn't want it, but they're paying you 3%. The spread is 5 minus 3. This is the way banks operate today. They take money cheaper from you and they give it to you, but they give it to somebody else in a more expensive way, okay? So whatever the difference is between the two, it's called the spread. That's how the banks make profit. Okay, simple. So how do Islamic banks work? Not too different <laughs> from a flow of funds perspective. Okay? You go and deposit your money in an Islamic bank or an Islamic institution. They use different concepts of profit sharing. Wadiya is deposit taking, Qard is interest-free loans. Mudaraba is the partnership or investment sharing that I told you about. The same relationship Khadija radiallahu anha had with her husband, right? Uh, the Prophet So they finance businesses based on the Islamic principles. They do buying and selling. Uh, they do partnerships. They do musharaka. They do murabha, etc. Right? 
Like if I gave you $100 and asked you for $150, I would ask you, Brother Hassan, what would you do with it? He said, I want to buy this phone. Well, in Islamic law, what we do is we buy this phone for $100, $100 we sell it to you for $150. But that's uh, bad. Buy. You accept it. Yeah. Well, we accept the loan too. It doesn't make it halal, right? <laughs> uh, that's not the point, right? But it's a form of trade, which is important. So now, look, this is the main difference. Number three. What is your name? Uh, Tanvir. Tanvir. Okay, I gave Brother Tanvir $100,000. And I'm going to charge him 5% interest as a bank, okay? Just an example. That means at the end of the year, how much do you have to pay me back? 100 plus 5,000, right? What would you do with that business? You say, I want to open up a, I don't know, a business, a coffee shop, a Tim Hortons. I don't know if you could find one for 100,000, but now whether you do well or not, how much do you have to pay me? 100 plus 5. In Islamic finance, I say, Brother Tanvir, here's a hundred thousand. Can I charge you five thousand dollars a year? Yes. Yes? Islamically? If I make money on it. If I make, if I make money Ooh, on it. No. I can't say that. No. I can say, give me fifty percent of the profits. Twenty percent of the profits. So if you make money, we make money. If you don't make money, we don't make money. You see the difference? Profit and loss sharing. If you lose all the money with the bank, do you still have to pay them back? Yes. Doesn't matter if you made money or not. Do you agree? You see the issue here? In Islamic finance, if you make money, we all make money. If you lose money, we lose money together. That's the main concept. Risk and reward sharing, profit and loss sharing. And then of course the banks, they share with you also as the investor, the returns. So in Islamic law, right? the sale contract is the mother of all contracts. All of these contracts, they come from the Origins of a sale contract. Even the marriage contract, the nikah that Bushir performs for you, is derived from the same contract, right? You have the pillars of a contract, you have the ijab and qubul, the offer acceptance, and you have the sirra, the expression. The consideration is the mahar and, and somebody's hand in marriage, right? Same thing. So, very good. So, these are all just the Highlight of how many contracts are derived from this that are used in Islamic finance. So you can do all kinds of financing. Home financing, car financing, equipment financing, things like that, right? So what is the fundamental difference between halal versus haram? The words that the brother spoke about. Allah has for Permitted trade, al bayt and forbidden riba. The concept of interest versus trade. And if I was to further give you a highlight of this, in a conventional bank, the fundamental component of its business is interest bearing. It's a lender borrower, creditor debtor relation. Bank is basically a money lender and the mode of operand the modus operandi is very simple. Qard ma'al riba, a loan with interest. The bank gives you a loan, you can pay them back with interest. Islamic bank is conducted under Sharia principle. It's trade and equity based. So we buy and sell things together. We it plays many roles, the buyer, seller, lessor. If you want to rent this facility, I say I'll do a lease ending with ownership with you. Right? Modes of operation, buy, sale, qar, loan, ijara, etc. And uh, in the Muslim world, Islamic banks also facilitate the payment of zakat, which is pretty nice. Okay, so all in all, what is Islamic finance? It's the outcome of our deen in banking. Right? 
So we have the banking and finance need. We use the Sharia sources, the Quran, Sunnah, Ismaq, Qiyas, all of these things. We take the fiqh and mu'amalat contracts, right? Then we derive contracts from it. Then we come up with Islamic banking and finance solutions and it translates to a summary into this. Prohibition of riba, speculation, right? Or for some gambling, haram, all of these things. Prohibition of certain investments, sectors like alcohol, pornography, right? Financial services, instruments in stock trading, options, short selling, not allowed. Islamic banking is asset-backed transaction. Asset-based, also they we call it now, okay? So if you have an underlying asset, you can structure a contract to be Sharia compliant. That's the main thing. Can't be just money on money. Right? Investment in real durable assets and then credit and debt products are allowed but not encouraged. Right? Debt, a dane is allowed not encouraged. Thank you. Jazakallah khair for your time and patience. Allah bless you. And, uh, you know, I'm going to stop here and I'll give it back to the Sheikh for any Q&A, inshallah. <laughs> Before we go to the Q&A, thank you so much, Brother Rehan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. A very comprehensive uh, overview of Islamic uh, finance. And uh, I hope that you've all benefited from that. And I'm sure you're going to have questions. We'll get to that now. And uh, those who are online, if you uh, want to pose your questions, I'll just scroll through and see if I find your questions. And yeah, yeah. A nice round of applause for our brother, uh, Rehan. Yes. Um, so now, at this point, before we, we start the actual Q&A, uh, I would like to invite uh, those who have children with them to escort your children uh, towards the front uh, of the building, uh, like within the building to the lobby, and uh, there one of our volunteers will take the children down to the basement where uh, there is some pizza waiting for them. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> pizza, okay. So, so just... Uh, and, you know, assist your children to go and, uh, and then our volunteers will take it from about the foyer. And uh, so, Rabbi Fabio, will you uh, take everyone down? And then for, for the rest of folks, uh, there's some other uh, meal coming in, but you have to wait for that. We have to get the spiritual food first, right? <laughs> okay, so first we deal with the Q&A and then we go to food. All right, so um, while the children are busy getting their pizza and whatever, Let's uh, deal with uh, questions and uh, answers. So, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. I'll point to you. You can read, uh, you know, say your question out loud. If you want to write I I your question on a slip of paper and pass it to the front, you can do that as well. Uh, last time, I had a phone with me, and I said, text your uh, question to that phone. But I, unfortunately, I forgot to bring the phone with me today. Uh, so, if you text it. To me now, it'll go to my kitchen table. And my phone if you want to. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're comfortable giving out your number, yes? I mean, your number is on the post. <laughs> sure, sure. The same number? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so if you want to text your question, text your question to Brother Rehan. His uh, fo phone number uh, where he can receive a text from you is 416-786-6063. So that's 786-6063. Can, can you uh, type it into your presentation so they'll see it right there? Uh, sure. Okay, so you type that number for you. In the meantime, I see a hand up, uh, up here somewhere. Uh, yes, you have a hand. Yes, brother. Uh, so, uh, no. uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Sorry, now in uh, this kind of age, we are in a recession. People are struggling financially. They can't pay their bills. And sometimes when we don't have money, we resort to a credit card. And sometimes, say, you have the money, but say, you get it the next week and use a credit card to purchase things. Mm -hmm. And so what is the Islamic, I guess, ruling on credit card? I know because you're signing a contract with the bank that says you won't pay interest if you go over that time. Mm -hmm. But is it a necessity to survive to use a credit card to get by? So can you yes, that? yes. So uh, that, just to let you know, the way I conceived of this uh, program today is that Brother Rehan is the visiting expert. He will have the first uh, opportunity to answer the questions and to inform us because he's bringing new information and uh, new studies to this center here. So we'd like to hear from him. And, but, but he had the idea that I will answer the questions. So, you know, 
It's like, who is going to really answer the question here? But I'm, I'm going to uh, defer to him. In the meantime, I'm going to look online to see what our online viewers are asking about. Okay? So, you can feel like that. So this is the question I wanted him to answer, to be honest. So I, every time I have a question like this, I always have a shade with me, and I'm glad I have it with me. So I really don't have an answer for you, all right? Um, this contract or this type of contract... Okay. Uh, the question is, am I allowed to uh, keep a credit card in Canada? Okay. Uh, and how does a credit card work? The credit card works as a loan that the company gives you, number one. Number two, if you go above a certain period of time, it charges you interest. Please, Brother Hassan knows. Ask him. He can give you the fatwa too. I'm just your brother. <laughs> so look, the answer that I've heard is very simple. Based on our necessity living in this country, you're allowed to have credit cards. The best thing to do is to pay them off fully to avoid the riba we aspect. Okay? Uh, of that contract. So yes, the simple answer is yes. What the illa or the reasoning is, there's a sheikh right next to me, he'll tell you, inshallah, right? Thank you. Next question. Okay, so, mm -hmm. go ahead, go ahead. So can we go Carry one on. brother, one sister? Is that okay? Uh, sure, sure. So. I would like to, uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, I would like to know the difference between, I know it's in Mudarabha, because like uh, somebody buys something for you and then you share. But what about the heart? How does the work in Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, companies or from the Islamic point of view? How does the Kurds yeah. work in an Islamic finance company? Mm -hmm. So how do Islamic companies Give lend money? Yeah, I know uh, Mudarraba, you buy something and then you share with them, like uh, But what about if you want to loan your money? If you give them your own money? No, no. If they loan your money, uh -huh. you take from them. Okay. So... Just like people, you would like to know the difference between cost, mudarba, and uh, share. What is it? It's a very good question. Do you have an answer to that? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll try. And, and while, I, while I have the microphone, uh, let me apologize to all of our online viewers because uh, the, the way I was uh, filming it, uh, they were seeing your entire presentation backwards. So it was a good training for them in reading text backwards. Uh, but finally, we got it right. The people have been begging me from the start, but I didn't. I didn't look at the messages. And uh, I really apologize to all of you for that. But uh, uh, inshallah, if you go back over the recording a little bit slower, then perhaps you will be still able to read uh, even the backwards uh, text. Um, but now we got it right. So, uh, yes, sister. So the, the question, as I understand it, you're, you're saying, okay, so if, if the Islamic institution is lending you money, uh, like, oh, first of all, like, what guarantee would they have that you would pay them back? And then... Like, what's in it for them? If you're going to give them back the same amount that they loaned you, like, how are they going to be in business? I think this is your question, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and Brother Rehan knows the industry better than I, than I do, uh, but I can only speak in a theoretical manner. So, first of all, if they're lending you money, they could take a security. And uh, as the Quran says, فَرِحَانٌ مَقْبُودًا and so it is a, a some item that is handed over. So the ownership is, is in the hand of the lender uh, for that period. When you pay back your money, then you, got, you get your uh, pond item back. So that's a simple matter for the, to guarantee uh, that the creditor will get his money back. But then, what about the question of profit? Uh, because an individual, uh, if, uh, you know, between brothers and sisters, we loan each other money, we, we don't want anything from it, we just want to help our uh, fellow Muslim, right? 
But uh, the institution is there, uh, and unless this is the Mu'assasa Khairiya, it is a, like a charitable foundation uh, for the purpose of helping people in need, uh, they're in the profit-making profit business, they want to get some uh, return on that. So what might they do? You mentioned some terms. So uh, one is that they might go into a, a Mudarba transaction with you. So which means that uh, you want to start a business as an example, and you don't have the capital, they'll give you the capital, but you run the business, but there is a profit and sharing, uh, there's a profit and loss sharing agreement from the inception. If you make uh, money in your business, the bank or the financial institution gets a portion as agreed uh, uh, from the inception. And also, if you suffer a loss, they, the bank will suffer a loss as well. As opposed to our usual commercial banks here, regardless whether you make a profit or, or you, make a, uh, you suffer a loss, you still have to pay the bank with interest. But the Islamic financial institution will enter into a partnership with you uh, in your business, and this is called Mudarwa. Yes, and then there, there is also Musharaka, uh, which means that they will, and, and Brother Rehan actually uh, can explain this better because I had a question about this and he explained it to me. And if I try to explain it to you, I won't get it right. So, Brother, Brother Rehan, yes. Okay. okay. Um, so, the difference between Mudaraba and Musharaka. Um, Mudaraba is when one party contributes the money, capital. And the other party does the work. Example, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the trader, he had the skill set, but he didn't have the money. Who had the money? Sayyidina Khadija. Okay? She contributed the capital, he contributed his time and effort. That's Mudara. So you're linking people with money with people who have a skill set, who can do something with your money to make more money. What a beautiful way to connect people together. Right? <laughs> and it started right with the most important person in our lives. The Prophet <laughs> Musharaka means you have money and I have money. They come together and they start a business. That's the main difference. One, there's only one party that contributes to the, uh, to the partnership. One person contributes towards the capital. Number two, all the parties or both parties contribute the capital and the effort. They don't have to, but that's the general meaning. Does that answer your question? Now she's asking about, about a loan that is provided I didn't by ask about the, uh, I know Moshe, Mudarabha, yeah, mm -hmm. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> Let me give you an example with a, uh, uh, how Islamic banking works, okay? If they can't charge you rib, if they cannot charge you a profit on the loan they give you, how do they do it? I'm going to tell you one simplified example. Let's say you want uh, $30,000. Why do you want it? You want to buy a car. Okay? For example, buy a house, buy a car, doesn't matter. Let's say you want to buy a car for $30,000. You say, I want financing, I don't have all the money. So I'm going to tell you, listen, I'm going to give you the loan for $30,000, but in five years, you'll pay me $35,000. Right? That's the loan. Every year you pay me $1,000 interest. Why do you need it? To buy a car. But the bank gives you a loan. A qarb. Ma'ar riba. This is how the bank does it. Give me one second. One second. Yes, that's, I'm telling you what they do here. Not in uh, Pakistan. Here. Right? So, how does an Islamic bank work? Or how does an Islamic financial institution work? They will tell you, we will buy the car for 30000 And we will sell it to you for 35000 Payable installs. Bayal Mu'ajjal. Bayal Murabah. So I will sell it to you in installments over a period of time. Does that make sense? 
So instead of engaging in a loan with interest, now I'm buying this car from him and then I'm selling it to you for a profit. Simple, right? It's not rocket science, but very simple. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question now? Okay. So, Brother Rehan, if uh, we give a chance to those who are joining us online, we have a question from Sister Aisha Jaddahood, uh, who asks, how can Forex uh, market be considered uh, Sharia? So the question is, how can Forex market be considered Sharia compliant? Um, I'll try to simplify the answer, but we only spoke about one type of riba today. Riba and Nasiya or financial riba. Forex comes under something called Riba al fadl I encourage you to read the hadith which talks about the six riba we item that the Prophet specifically mentioned. And it's classified into two categories. Monetary, which was gold and silver at that time, and then the staple essential foods. Dates, barley, wheat, and uh, one of Salt. Salt, dates, barley, and wheat. Yes. Okay. Forex is halal because I'm trading dollars for rupees, for euros, etc. But the requirements for forex trading is it must be done on the spot. I cannot tell you that give me a hundred euros today and I'll pay you, let's say, I don't know, fifty dollars tomorrow. I don't know what the exchange rate is. Okay. You cannot do that. If you give me a hundred euros, I have to give you fifty dollars right now or vice versa. We have to exchange together. But in Islamic finance, or in a pillars of a contract, you can defer the payment. For example, the car. I gave you the car today, I delivered the product, but I'm asking for payment later. Or you pay me today and I'll deliver later. But if you defer both, then it becomes gharan, uncertainty. And in Forex, you cannot do even one or the other. It has to be exchanged right there on the spot. You cannot do deferred delivery, of one or the other. It has to be a spot transaction. That's the simplified answer. Next question. Yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry, why don't you moderate? Sure, sure. Okay, sure. Um. So I heard this question regarding your concept of buy now, or save now and buy later. How does that apply to education here? When you have to take loans to pay out to fund your education here. Hmm. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. So, so for for a question like this, I would um, you know uh, put some reliance on the uh, fatwa given by the European Fatwa Council and uh, some other scholars who uh, say that. Uh, you know, while it is true that the hadith says that five people are cursed with regards to interest, the one who gives it, the one who takes it, the one who writes the contract, and the two witnesses, uh, nonetheless, uh, scholars are able to see a difference between uh, giving and taking. And they say that uh, the, the, the taking of interest, that is the, the thing that is condemned in the Quran again and again. Never in the Quran is the giving of interest forbidden. But the hadith does forbid it. So they say that the hadith is forbidding it because uh, by giving it, you become a sort of accessory to the one who is taking it. So if you don't give it, you can't take it, right? Uh, simple logic. Uh, but of course, there is a difference in that there is no excuse for the one who is taking it, but the one who is giving it may be compelled by circumstances to give it. In other words, to take a loan uh, that is interest bearing, that one will be um, uh, pressed to, to give interest on. So because of this difference, essentially, between the two. They say that uh, in circumstances of haja or need, or, or need uh, one has the permission to do it. So, you know, buying the first house that you're going to live in, um, as opposed to one for investment, um, and they put some conditions and, and stipulations, but nonetheless, that's basically what they're aiming at. Uh, so the house that you're going to live in, uh, if you need it for education, uh, because what they're looking at is that uh, you, you, it's not sustainable for a Muslim community living uh, in the West uh, um, as, my, as a minority for, for everyone to just say hands off, we're not going to have, we're not going to touch any of this because it would mean 
uh, that uh, the non-Muslims will be the homeowners, the non-Muslims will be the educated people in the society, they will be the bosses and manager, and they will decide who to hire, who to fire, uh, who to rent their houses to, who to kick out from their apartments, and, and so on. And so it's not sustainable long term. So it is a need uh, for Muslims to, to have access to housing, uh, access to education, and so for that reason, uh, they will uh, permit, uh, with some stipulations, uh, you know, you cannot, you don't have a better alternative, and so on, they will put all these stipulations, but that's the basic result. And uh, they differentiate between a darura in Islamic terms, which means necessity, and a haja, which means a need. Uh, so darura, meaning necessity, this is like life and death, like you have to uh, eat even pork to, to survive, so because you, you don't want to die from starvation, right? Um, so, so that's a question of life and death, that's called darura, but uh, it, below darura um, is haja, a need, uh, like, like we have needs. Uh, they're not as, so essential, theoretically, one can go through life living in a rented premises, uh, you're not going to die from it. Uh, and theoretically, you can go through life without a, a, a higher education, you're not going to die from it. But, uh, as a long-term strategy for the community as a whole, this is not sustainable. It is a real need for people to have access to this, and, and this is why they make that differentiation. So, may Allah start to the guide as to what is this. Is that satisfactory to you? I don't know. See, that's why I have the shape of me, <laughs> Thank you. So we go up brothers, sisters, and then online. So uh, there's a sister with a hand up. I have a question from the sister. Oh, sure. Maybe you can answer this one too, Shay. Uh-huh. Okay. Today is a big challenge for young people to buy a house in Canada. Yes. Condo. Oh, condo, sorry. Uh -huh. Condo. Mm -hmm. uh, how young people can buy a house with so high interest? How does the Islamic institution bank is there interest on the house loan? Okay. Um, I think you're, you're the best person to. Sure. So, you know what? Uh, buying a house today is not a Muslim problem. It's a Canadian problem. <laughs> I, I don't own a house till today. I help a lot of people buy houses, but I don't own a house myself. Okay, so this is an economic problem. It's not an Islamic problem. I just want to let you know, right? Uh, halal meat is more expensive than regular meat. Why? It's not an Islamic problem. It's an economic problem. Supply and demand. See what I'm saying? There's smaller stores out there for halal meat. And there's a lot of Muslims, ma mashallah, right now. So before it was even more expensive. Now it's becoming less and less, right? So it takes time. So that's the simplified answer. But how do Islamic banks function? They function very similar uh, to the conventional banks, but they use different types of structures like this, right? They, try, they use the murabaha structure, which is the easy one that I explained, that there's a musharaka, then there's an ijara type structure as well. Okay, so unfortunately, this is more of an economic question than an Islamic question, inshallah. So, Brother uh, Rehan, we have a question here from uh, uh, online from uh, Jihan Alam. Uh, asking, uh, what about value, the, the problem of value depreciation? So, I, I guess what Jihan is, uh, heading, uh, is uh, aiming at is that, you know, if I loan you money, and then you pay me back in 10 years, you pay me back the exact currency amount, uh, what you pay back in 10 years is not going to be worth uh, the same as the money that I borrowed from you here and now. So, th that's the value depreciation problem. How do you address that? <laughs> All the hard questions here, uh, but see again, this concept of lending money in dollars, in rupees, in euros, um, again, a systemic problem. For example, inflation, we're facing inflation in Canada at an all-time high right now. This is the first time in my adult life here in Canada that I'm actually seeing the grocery bills go up. You're seeing that? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Seeing the gas prices go up? We've seen that a few times, but not grocery, restaurant. We're all feeling it, right? Yes. Where I come from, we feel that every year. <coughs> mm -hmm. Right? 
in the Muslim world, unfortunately, different parts of the world, we feel that every year and we talk about crimes increasing, we talk about robberies, etc. We're seeing an increase, a spike in crimes in our very city. Why? Because people are facing an increase in living costs. You know why? Inflation. But coming back to the sister's question, the simple answer is if you lend money in dollars, let's say you lend someone $10,000 and it's buying capacity or it's purchasing power today, 10 years ago is only worth six or 7,000, you cannot say account for inflation and do that. You know what you should do as an alternative? Lend people money in gold. Say I'm giving you one ounce of gold, it's worth $1,200, I'll give you this amount, but I'm lending you gold, not the dollar. Because gold is a natural hedge against inflation. How about that? So 10 years from now, if they have to return this gold ounce to you, you'll be really happy. <laughs> and you won't have to worry about uh, fiat money, right? The money that's created uh, in the recent 50 years that we live, right? So, and it's not backed by anything, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, next question. Okay, really yeah. So, Shorting is not allowed, right? I mean, I ask this question in my uh, session sometimes. Uh, will Robin Hood go to Jannah if his name was Rahim al Maktoum or something? Right? Yes? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, but we don't know. The thing is, what did he do? He stole from the rich and he gave it to the poor. Right? He did a good thing by helping the poor, but he stole. Or he did something haram. See what I'm saying? Does the mean justify the end? Shea, you have a different view? Tell us, <laughs> right? I'm just telling you. Our risk is written. I told you about our risk, right? It's written. Short selling, main problem. You cannot sell something you don't own. Or it doesn't exist. Yeah, but they're all forms of short. I know we're sophisticated. Go on, shoot. Well, while we're sophisticated, uh, we're still human beings and we need to eat. And uh, I, at this point, uh, I would like to break the formal program. Sorry about that. I know you have questions, but some of you can uh, approach Brother Rehan and we'll save his meal separately. Uh, yes, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll save his uh, meal. In the meantime, uh, you can approach him with some questions informally. Uh, if he is open to that, uh, but the rest of you I would invite to come to the uh, lobby area uh, where you will uh, receive your meal. Please uh, do that and before you get up to do that, uh, let me make a couple of brief announcements. One is that uh, the Arabic class that many of you have been waiting for uh, will start inshallah in mid-February. The um, uh, registration forms for that are accessible online. You go to our website islaminfo.com slash events islaminfo.com slash events you'll find the registration form there. Uh, please fill that out. Uh, at the moment we're, we're just offering the basic, uh, very basic one. Many of you are beyond that so it may not apply to you but inshallah after Ramadan we'll continue the series. So think of this as model, module one and inshallah after Ramadan more modules will be available. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we are holding a fundraising dinner to support our television broadcast called Let the Quran Speak. That will be on March 4th, March 4th in Mississauga. 
The tickets for that are available with us, so please get your tickets now while it's still on the early bird price. And uh, even if you're not planning to come, do buy a ticket anyway to express your support for that program uh, so that we can continue to broadcast the message uh, of Islam on television throughout this country and uh, online through our YouTube channel and other social media around the globe. May Allah SWT bless you all, reward you all. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, Brother Arman is trying to catch my attention. Okay, yes, and uh, 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 we are asking everyone, please obtain your meal, but do not eat here. Uh, we only allow the children to eat because naturally children will be, uh, you know, eager to eat. And uh, so, so they have eaten their, their pizza, but the other meal which is being given out now, we ask you to take that home with you and eat it uh, elsewhere. Jazakumullah khairan, thank you all for coming. It's been a wonderful program. Thank you, Brother Rehan, very informative lecture. Ya Masada, bless you all and regard you all. Wa for For those of you who joined me online, so sorry again about uh, the mirrored uh, um, uh, streaming. And uh, I thank you all for being here and for engaging with your questions and comments. May Allah SWT bless you all. Fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.